So welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to participate in the webinar virtual projects uh, at HBO, Successes and Challenges. So as many of you may know, over the last year, HBO has had to pivot from a largely on the ground volunteer model to virtual. Um, so while we had begun exploring this, really uh, over the last couple of years, then when the pandemic hit, it certainly had to be fast-tracked quite a bit. And um, we have been excited to see this rapid evolution over the past year. And in the last two years, it's really exciting to be able to say that HBO volunteers have completed over 188 e-volunteer assignments and provided over 5,600 hours of virtual education and mentorship. So that's really impressive um, uh, from at least from my perspective to go from three years ago, maybe to hardly doing any e-learning and just kind of the uh, capacity and flexibility of our volunteers and our partners to, to really pivot quickly uh, and to be able to change the education model and engagement to one that's virtual. So on our call today, we are delighted to have two HBO volunteers who've been leaders in facilitating remote education and training at HBO sites and to talk about some of the successes and the challenges that they've experienced with implementing virtual learning at HBO sites. So the presenters today, we have Dr. Habib Ghadar, who is a medical oncologist and hematologist practicing at Texas Oncology since 1995. He's board certified in internal medicine, medical oncology, hematology, and hospice and palliative medicine. His devotion to education and interest in global health led him to join HBO. And over the past five years, he served as an oncology volunteer in Bhutan and Nepal, where he's helped train physicians and oncology nurses. And he ser currently serves as co-director for HBO's palliative care program in Bhutan. And then we have Dr. Elizabeth Schick, who is associate professor and director of global health at the University of Colorado, School of Dental Medicine. She completed her DDS and her residency in pediatric dentistry and master's of public health degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she works part-time in private practice and currently serves as the director of global health initiatives at the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine and Center for Global Health. Elizabeth coordinates the dental school's outreach program based in community health center in rural Guatemala and she also works on a national level promoting best practices in global health and dental education and is the founder and chair of the newly formed Global Health Work Group of the American Dental Education Association. Dr. Schick is a member of HBO's Oral Health Steering Committee and has done some of her virtual work in Nepal, which she will speak about today. So to start today's webinar, I am going to be inviting Elizabeth and Habib uh, to provide an overview of their projects, followed by a structured Q&A. And then we're gonna open up for questions from you as participants. And you're welcome to put your questions as they come to you in the chat box or uh, to hold your questions until after the presentations are finished. So with that, I would like to start with inviting Habib to give us an overview of his work in Bhutan and the virtual education training that they've done there. Thank you, April. And thank you for all the participants and the volunteers. And I'm really hoping that we'll be able to recruit some of you by the end of the webinar today. So we'll be covering uh, the palliative care program in Bhutan, how we transitioned into the, uh, we'll call it uh, e-volunteering, although this is uh, the most simplistic form of e-volunteering that has certainly worked. So the palliative care program is probably among the newest projects HBO have, have started. Uh, we started the program, I would say a few months before the pandemic. And it's basically a home visitation program by a group of nurses, mainly uh, nurses who've had some training in, in palliative care. And they perform home visits accompanied by a local physician or an HBO volunteer uh, who's available on site. The purpose of that volunteer would be to train the nurses to become more comfortable with uh, palliative care issues. The team usually is joined by a, uh, when available, by a spiritual counselor who is a Buddhist monk from the hospital or a social worker. 
So the program, as I said, was uh, really in its infancy. It only started around six months, more or less, before the uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, but really had a very, very nice run in terms of growth initially. We were on a run having um, good, you know, a, we had three or four volunteers already uh, serving there. One volunteer was there for three months. Um, and the nurses were becoming uh, comfortable with the whole idea of, of palliative care, which is fairly new to, uh, to Bhutan, I would say. The idea of the program came as all programs in HVO, a response to a need expressed by the locals. So the uh, HVO have had an oncology program for a good 10 years before. And uh, it was the observation of most oncology volunteers, myself included, that most cancers, most cancer patients that we see tend to have a very advanced stage. So the need for palliative care was really obvious. Uh, so a collaboration between HBO and ASCO uh, uh, Spear had the, uh, an awareness conference that was performed around two years ago just to introduce the idea of palliative care to the community. And the response was really phenomenal. I mean, we had around 70 attendees at the time. And by the end of the conference, they had a, a, a work plan to, to start, you know, some awareness to palliative care. A pilot program then followed uh, where we felt the need was mainly in the home visitation element because really the only source of care for patients in Bhutan was to come to the emergency room or to the oncology clinic. So that started the idea of the program at the time uh, by giving basic training to three nurses that the uh, hospital funded those positions. And the, uh, the training was really fairly basic. So clearly the nurses were not in a position to act independently. And there is not a palliative care specialist in Bhutan. So the program really relied on on-site volunteers uh, that HBO was sending uh, until either a trained physician in Bhutan becomes comfortable or the nurses become comfortable in, uh, in addressing patients' needs. Um, so the program grew over the course of six months from serving around 10 patients initially to over 100 patients, uh, from doing visitations once per week to three times a week. Uh, with really all the successes that uh, we all enjoyed. Uh, the problem, though, is the nurses were not quite comfortable taking care of those patients uh, when the pandemic hit, and there was not a local um, uh, physician who's, who specialized in palliative care to provide the necessary support. So the co-directors with HBO and ASCO kind of started brainstorming uh, how could we sustain that program. And of course, there are elements that are out of our control. Um, the nurses don't have good internet access. Uh, phone calls are expensive. But one thing which existed there is 3G for the locals is cheap, so we can use WhatsApp. So we started by something very basic. We said, we're available. Call us when you need us. Uh, reach out anytime you need to. And what started as being available as needed transitioned into a formal hour, initially just the co-directors, um, and we scheduled an hour that worked for all of us, uh, that the nurses will bring on the um, cases that they feel challenging, and we'll discuss those cases during the course of an hour. So really it was, if you want to call it the bare bone basics in terms of communication, a WhatsApp phone call, they'll call us and we'll discuss patients and, and we move on. Uh, it really became very obvious that the nurses are becoming dependent on that hour because they really don't have a local resource to tap on. So we called on the all prior volunteers in palliative care and in oncology to assess their uh, interest in, in participating. And, you know, there's, as we all know in HBO, there's no shortage of people with big hearts. So we had an overwhelming response by uh, the prior volunteers, around 15 to 20 of them responded with interest. 10 of them signed on, and uh, now we have a scheduled hour on WhatsApp at this point, uh, where we allow up to three volunteers to be to participate in that hour uh, to discuss cases that the patients, that the nurses feel challenging. So we moved on to a next step whereby nurses will prepare a summary of those cases. They'll email them to us uh, ahead of time. Uh, we prepare feedback. And uh, Annette Galassi, and I have to say, 
every program needs an Annette in terms of organizational skills. She uh, prepared the Google Drive to whereby we uh, input uh, any educational material. Uh, nurses could upload photos of, let's say, wound or you know something that needs attention. Um, and of course, the, uh, that helps the, the participants on the call to prepare their feedback of how to address those, uh, those cases. So and we really felt with something as basic as a WhatsApp phone call, we're able to enhance the training of those, uh, of those nurses and more importantly, sustain a program that in my opinion, I think was threatened to collapse because the nurses were definitely in no position to act autonomously um, and definitely the lack of a local palliative care specialist would make such a program uh, impossible to, uh, to carry through. So with a very basic technology, we're able to at least uh, maintain uh, patient feedback. The growth of the program has continued. Uh, if it didn't enough because it's because of the pandemic, not because of the feedback. Um, and we've moved on to try to expand to other elements within the e-volunteering format. So uh, between HPO and ASCO, we've, um, we were able to fund a, a laptop that allows us to, to do video conferencing. So the nurses received it last week. The hospital provided uh, an internet access for that laptop with a good bandwidth to allow us to do that. And we'll be starting a lecture series now with the, uh, with the nurses. Uh, other volunteers have signed on to uh, either be participants in the case conferences, lecture series, or we'll be starting the role play sessions as well. So I really feel, you know, with uh, starting somewhere was, uh, was, in my opinion, salvaged a program that, uh, that was still very, very fresh. And uh, the reward that we've seen from the nurses uh, and the patients, I'm hoping, uh, has been extremely, extremely rewarding for us. So I think that uh, that probably will give us an overview of where we're at. <laughs> great, thank you, Habib. That that's wonderful. I think your project is a great example of um, one how I think the word e-learning can be intimidating to people, but you guys started at such a basic level with WhatsApp. Right, it doesn't have to be a really robust or complicated system or method of engagement that by starting simple with the technology on the ground with WhatsApp, you were able to meet the needs of your colleagues overseas. And then it's evolved so nicely now, as you're saying to not just case conferences, but implementing lectures and role playing. And now you're gonna be able to do live engagements via video. So I, I think it's a perfect example of just starting small with the resources on the ground. Um, Otherwise, it wouldn't have been sustainable, right? So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's wonderful. Well, thank you for that, and we'll have plenty of follow-up questions for you in just a moment. So now, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Schick to uh, give a brief overview of her project uh, in Nepal. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I also want to um, thank you for all the support that you guys gave us while we were doing it, because there's. Um, a lot of back and forth emails and getting it all organized and coordinated. So that was really helpful. And um, also wanted to point out on this Zoom is David Ciesla. You can see him there. He was also one of my colleagues that participated in this. Uh, so what, what I believe happened was this was also in response to the hosts reaching out to HVO for a request for help. And I think it also was a result of the pandemic with COVID. Um, and what my understanding was, and please correct me or add to this part, I believe that during COVID, they had to rapidly sort of abruptly shut down the dental school, which happened all over the world, really, um, and making dental education extremely difficult to continue at the time. And the students, of course, are relying on their continuity and program to get through years after years to graduate. So it, it was actually pretty problematic for healthcare education around the world. Um, and the dental schools suffered um, not only with didactic work that they needed to supply, but also their clinic work was highly impacted. So um, at least half of the dental education is hands-on clinic work. Um, and that, you know, there's still disruptions from this today in the U.S. everywhere. Um, so we, we kind of brainstormed on what we could do to help from a distance. We called it the Global Distance Learning Program, just in emails. And... Um, decided that didactic would be the, the best way that we felt we could help them 
and they uh, they wanted some help with didactics too. So we're pediatric dentists. So uh, me, David, and another colleague of ours, I don't think he's on the call, but Michael Sa uh, in um, UCSF in California, we decided to, we kind of put together a proposal for six Zoom webinars over important pediatric dental topics. So it would be like a lecture you'd get at dental school um, and hopefully help them out. So we, we chose six important topics and it was research-based. So we, did, we included um, five or six literature journal readings articles and we would email them out. We set up, um, I wanna say six consecutive Wednesdays, I believe is when we did it. And um, it was all by Zoom and they, we had anywhere from 50 to 250 attendees. And I believe it was also inclusive of faculty and practicing dentists in Nepal. We actually had a little bit of good variety, I noticed. And so we did six presentations, one hour each, and took questions in the chat box at the end, opened it up to discussion and learning and sharing, which was really nice having that bi-directional sharing that you know is, is really nice in global health. Um, I'm trying to think what else about the program was to mention. Um, I think that's basically the overview of, of what we did. But feel free to add anything, David, as well. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. That, that was great. David, I saw that you unmuted. Do you, do you have anything you wanted to add? Oh, no, I was just going to say, I just impressed with the, uh, the scope of providers. It wasn't just students, it was uh, professors and outside providers. And I just thought it was very well received and um, it was good. I love the collaborative. You know, they did some things different than we did. It was great to get feedback from them. So it was just a wonderful experience. Great. Yeah, I think it definitely provided, you know, the, the overarching message here is global health volunteering. And so it was a really easy really and rewarding opportunity way to do it. It's so simple to implement. So I really recommend it for any healthcare profession or a host partnerships you have with education and schools in other countries, because it was really easy to do. I mean, the hardest part was staying up till 8 p.m. to do the lecture because it was 8 a.m. their time. <laughs> <laughs> and that just is a function of how tired I get at night, but it was easy <laughs> other than that. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a helpful summary. And I think you know, for that project, like you said, I mean, the, the education had all but stopped in, in country, but um, through this collaboration and just being creative and investing in these alternative, right, methods, uh, right, just to the same end that we, we were able to work with our partners and provide that education so that the education or the program didn't have to stop and these students can still progress through their training and meet the needs of their patients. So that's wonderful. Yeah, I, and, I did want to say too, this was kind of a pilot. So it seems like there was only six one hour lectures, but it was just a way to start off and see how it went. And I think it's something that could definitely be expanded to add a lot more to their help, helping their curriculum and teaching. Great, great. Yeah, it's a lot of these things, once you get started um, and people get comfortable just with the pivot to the online platform and method of learning, it really, you realize how many doors are opened um, and that how much you can utilize online support of our partners uh, when even when we resume volunteers on the ground to continue to reinforce and support that education. So I think you opened a great door, Elizabeth, to kind of move in and, and hear from you uh, since since you're you're already here, and then Habib on what some of the challenges are and you that you face specifically. And you know, you alluded to some of the ones that I think are more obvious to people that of course there are going to be time zone differences that you have to work around. Um, and of course, when we design these projects, there are issues around technology that have to be addressed and just assuring that everyone has the right uh, technology to actually engage. And, you know, as Abib said, for them, WhatsApp worked, for you guys, Zoom lectures worked. Um, so sorting through some of those more obvious sort of technical um, barriers and logistical barriers, but, other than those, I'm curious, uh, what were some of the challenges that you that you faced that might have been foreseen and you tried to prepare for or things that might have caught you off guard when you were trying to pivot to this online learning? 
Um, you mean other than the logistics or a little bit of that? Obviously, the Zoom internet connection issue was a challenge for the attendees in Nepal at times. Mm -hmm. And we don't know for sure if everyone who wanted to be there could attend or if they had Zoom access. I think the faculty there um, sort of did a, you know an overview and said, determined that enough students and faculty could attend. So that's what we did. But I don't really know. I mean, that's definitely a challenge to know if there was another platform that would have worked better. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, you know, we, we developed the program pretty quickly where we just sort of chose what we thought were some important pediatric dental topics. We don't really know. It, it was more of a challenge, I guess, to figure out what do they exactly need. And our, our program was done pretty quickly to help out in a pinch, but I think moving forward, I don't know if I call it a challenge or an opportunity or both, but figuring out more from the host, what, what lectures do they really need that, that we can provide that will help them? Because we can definitely tailor it more to them. Um, and what we did was kind of started with six basic important topics. Um, that we felt would be a part of any curriculum anyway, but that that would be somewhat of a challenge opportunity to figure out, you know, a little better if you were going to have more time to develop a program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, I mean, I we we felt like there was very little in language barriers. I felt like their their English was really quite good. Of course, I don't know what you know, we tried to speak slowly and use very basic language on our slides. So uh, a challenge, I don't really know the full understanding of the students that we're watching. Um, and it, you know, if we, we got what year in school they were and we kind of tailored it to what we thought would be appropriate, but I don't know if their education was the same as ours and a third year student as a third year student. So was the level of our presentations appropriate? I mean, these are some of the things that I think could be figured out in the future a little more. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think with enough lead time, right, you could look at um, assessing baseline knowledge prior to developing courses and um, putting some of those tools in place just to help make sure you're teaching to the right level. Right. But that is an important challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the priority in my mind definitely is moving towards um, hosts' needs, you know, so that that's something I don't want to overlook. For sure. Great. Thank you. And what about you, Habib? What uh, what challenges were were unique to to your work in Bhutan? All right. Um, so uh, apart from the technical, as you mentioned, and Elizabeth, don't complain about the eight p.m. Ours was eleven p.m. So that's just for the record here. <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> uh, no, but that's fine. Uh, so really, probably for me, if I were to identify an issue, I would say uh, we're dealing with a, a different nursing culture. Um, in Bhutan, uh, and then it's a very unfortunate uh, element. I mean, uh, nurses are used to follow doctors' orders, and it, it's uh, working on autonomously is not part of the uh, of the of the nursing culture, I would say. And HBO, at least during the oncology program, have done a phenomenal job addressing that element, uh, making sure we always pair a physician and a, and a nurse at the same time, try to model what a relationship a doctor-nurse uh, leadership team should have. So, but for us, we were dealing with a relatively new program. These were three nurses who had basic training in palliative care and were asked to be available autonomously uh, on site to, to take care of patients without a physician. So the whole idea of asking to attend to patients without a doctor telling, asking them or telling them what to do was, uh, I mean, they, feel, they really felt crippled. And, and the main element of how do you instill that confidence in, uh, in those nurses through that mm, long distance forum? So, uh, the, and of course, it was a, a collective brainstorming session among those who have been there or have uh, done some work with the, with the culture in Bhutan. And we basically decided that we're going to limit the first few uh, WhatsApp calls uh, to those who have spent some time with those specific nurses, meaning the three volunteers who have been to Bhutan have dealt with those nurses. It's a very, I don't know if the word reserved is correct, but a very timid, reserved culture for the nurses. And for them to even speak up and ask questions was, it takes time for them to develop that comfort level. So we felt that by limiting uh, the forum for only those specific three or four volunteers initially, 
would allow those those nurses to become more comfortable asking questions. We encourage them to ask more questions until they they felt okay. Well, we we are the caretakers. We are the caregivers here, and and. Um, uh, we're, we're able to ask any questions that we need, and, and the doctor is here to support what we're delivering. Uh, so beyond that, uh, we made sure that one of those uh, known volunteers to the nurses are, are available on the call, and we added two additional spots from new volunteers who have not who have been to Bhutan but have not dealt with those nurses before. So I would say that probably was the biggest challenge to try to establish on long distance. Uh, the rest would be the technical. But, but that part, the fact that the program was new, the nurses are not comfortable dealing with, with palliative care by themselves, and their culture of not being able to, uh, to work without a doctor's order uh, was probably the biggest element to, uh, to deal with uh, remotely. Thank you, Habib. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I, I can imagine that, you know, it's challenging sometimes to um, overcome some of those cultural barriers, even when you're in person on the ground. So I can only imagine kind of the added layer of complication when it's, you're trying to build those relationships and that rapport and that trust virtually. Right. And, and, and really the discipline of palliative care, I mean, there is a lot of handholding and then and, and there's a lot of role play. I mean, you, you sort of, teach palliative care by sharing a patient, so to say. So it, it, it's, it's not a, a discipline that lends itself, lends itself to lecturing. And um, so there is a lot that needed to be done on the ground. So that's why make, choosing the, the volunteers wisely, uh, I guess, was, was a key element in making sure that the nurses become comfortable with that work. Great. And, you know, I think a nice follow-up question, and, and I can start with you, Habib, is um, what type of feedback, if any, have you gotten from, from the learners um, related to the program? Uh, th that's honestly is the biggest reward, I would say. I mean, to sum it up, I would say they've become dependent on that hour. Um, it's like they look forward, waiting on that hour with the list of questions that, okay, now our, uh, now we can have our questions answered. And... And that's been the feedback by every volunteer who's, uh, who's, who's attending the call. I mean, uh, they're there because they have specific questions that they won't answer. There's a frustrating moment that they don't know how to handle. Uh, that, that, that really is the, the biggest element uh, and the most rewarding feedback, I would say. Um, and again, they've, they've developed the courage to ask questions freely um, and, and really have requests. So like uh, I, was, I mentioned Annette a minute ago, uh, you know, she asked them about what other elements they'd like added. They're the ones who mentioned topics. I mean, they now have, we want something about communication or, or uh, you know, and she suggested role play and that that's uh, ongoing. But the fact that they've developed the confidence to ask uh, for those elements, I really think is, uh, is important. And the other important feedback, I would say, uh, it looks like uh, the, the idea caught on within the oncology department because uh, Miklos, Dr. Miklos Simon, uh, who's still with the oncology, uh, with the HVA oncology team, uh, mentioned that the oncology unit uh, wanted to start something similar. They asked if we can do a weekly call uh, to mimic a, a tumor board or um, or because there is no medical oncologist in Bhutan either. Uh, so it looks like uh, they label it as a success, which is why they want to model it into the other disciplines as well. That's a wonderful testament to the program. That's great. And Elizabeth, um, Thinking about the, the same question from your site, when we, you're looking at your learners, what type of feedback have you guys gotten in terms of um, the lectures? So when we were developing the whole thing, we decided from the very beginning that we wanted to collect some sort of outcome evaluation. Um, I just think, in especially in dental global health, there's not a lot of measurements and, and data collection and evaluations of programs that happens. And that's uh, something that I think is important as well. So we just did a very basic post lecture survey that we sent out 
Um, and again, like the, the faculty at the Nepali Dental School um, was very instrumental in making this happen where they, they were our middle person and sent it out to the students and said, please complete this. And so I put a few on screen just to review, just because I had it all in a nice format already. So I can show that really quick. I'll share screen. Okay, so of course, very basic. <laughs> First question was how many lectures of the six did you attend? Um, and you can see we've got percentages here. We got a fair amount of majority attending five and six of them. So that was nice attendance, we thought. And then we had, I won't go through all these, but it just gives you an example of the survey that we sent out. Um, how was it presented in organized format? Did we use clear, easy to understand language? We did want to kind of see if we could assess the English and the understanding on the other end. And could they hear clearly? Was the information new? Was it useful? Do you actually treat children in your practice? So we sent these out because we thought it would be valuable, this set of questions. And then we did ask them to make comments. And so these were really fun to read through. We got a lot of comments, which I was happy about. I just put a few up here that, um, you know, the first one I thought this was funny. Yes, thank God for English. <laughs> so luckily their English level was, was very good. Um, just really, I, I wasn't sure what that was going to be. So I was very happily surprised. Um, and then some comments about, you know, it was effective. They do, some of them do miss the classroom um, and online is distracting. I think that's what I hear feedback a lot from even my kids doing remote school will say that, uh, but we got positive feedback for the most part. Um, and then we asked what they learned and we got at least 20 or 30 comments. Um, and the information experiences and sharing came up a lot. A lot of them did use the word sharing, which I thought was really great and kind of a testament to how we did conduct the lectures and the discussion afterwards, that it, it wasn't just us um, saying, this is exactly what you need to do and this is how we do it. We did sort of a review of literature for the most part and current literature. We did include some, anything we could find from Nepal in their oral health literature as well to make it more relevant. Um, and this one mentions the discussion after was informative. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show this because I had it in easy to see format and it was very easy to do. But again, thank you guys for helping do that. Yeah, thank you. No, I think that that data is great to see. And um, I think and it's an example too that it's, it doesn't have to be really complicated to evaluate the outcomes. You know, that data was relatively straightforward, but it gave you guys really key insight like you said, into the basic stuff, was the lecture easy to follow? Was the content relevant? Um, how do you imagine applying it? So that, as you said, you look to develop and refine your courses in the future, you have a little bit of a baseline data and knowledge now to kind of move forward in a more informed way. I think that's wonderful you guys were able to do that. And it sounds like one of the key things to the success of that, which I think we might find is critical in a lot of uh, virtual projects, is you you had a champion on the ground and, and Dr. Kofle and, and, and you have individuals at the site that are really bought in and kind of making the pieces move um, on site, which I would imagine is quite critical to the success. Well, they were so organized and their emails were concise and really good communication between us and them. I mean, we would email and they would respond back right away. We had no problems with the organization, which was great. And I, I think Dr. Hollander also had spent time in Nepal and had built a relationship there with an HBO, so has a strong presence in Dr. Kafle, as you mentioned. So mm -hmm. the strong partnership is key here as well. And I think why we had up to 250 people attending at one time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think the last question from me, and then I'll go through some of the questions in the chat, um, but just any sort of final thoughts from you guys in terms of lessons learned or recommendations, either when you think about how you might scale up e-learning at these particular projects or also uh, information you think might be helpful to others on this call that are looking to design an e-learning opportunity with other projects that they might be working on. I guess I'll, I'll start. Um... I guess you you mentioned it first, April, and I really think it's key. Uh, start somewhere. I mean, don't don't really wait till you have the most elaborate system that that uh, that can work. I mean, I mean, I guess the cliche statement 
don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean, uh, really work with what you've got, no matter how small, it will make a difference. For us, I have to say there was a sense of urgency. The program was just starting. So by not providing support, you know, we could threaten the existence of the program. So what's up it is, I, have to, I can't tell you that that was a, a, a deep thought that led us there. It was an, an immediate need. You know, you take a call and then you move on. But really the important element, I would say, start with what you've got, no matter how small it is. And the program will expand itself, uh, will, meaning the, the, the remote or e-volunteering element will, will expand itself. That, that probably will be uh, what my main lesson learned, I would say. Um, and I think this is going to be part of how we do things going forward. I mean, I, I, can't, uh, I can't see that the experience of the past year and a half, no matter how horrible it is, there are some positives that's going to come out of this. You know, the basic element of us on the call, for instance, there are three volunteers. Now, every volunteer has a, uh, had a strength in palliative care. So the, the fact that you're able to have uh, three people weigh in on a particular case of how to manage a particular problem is a plus. Whereas if you have on-site volunteer only, uh, you're, on to, you're going to get the perspective of that particular doctor for the month. Uh, when you get a, you sort of have, as if you're having a tumor board every single time, which is really beautiful. Uh, so I think certain elements uh, will be, certain lessons will be learned and, and, and will be incorporated in how we do uh, things going forward as well. But I, again, I'm, I'm really hoping we'll be able to go back on site because that's, to me, that's the, the best part of volunteering still. So, and if you've ever been to Bhutan, do it. I mean, uh, this place is magical, I should say. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Habib. And Elizabeth, do you have any, any additional thoughts on kind of your, your take-home lessons? Um, I think just how easy it was, really easy to implement. I mean, especially if you have two academic hosts, partner, and and other partner, uh, us, not, us and a host partner are both academic institutions. Most of us that are faculty already have a lot of lectures, things ready to go. Um, then um, it was so easy to implement something like this. And if there's a host academic institution that can benefit from this and we can identify and work with them on tailoring a, a type of curriculum or at least just helping and supplementing, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the, all the sessions and um, learned a lot as well. So it's definitely just a great experience. It's so easy to do. So I encourage it definitely uh, if we can do more of it and expand. If anyone has any questions, let me know. But I'm hoping we can do more of this for dentistry too. Great, thank you. And it's so nice to hear from both of you. You know, you're saying it was so easy, which I think when people think about doing an online lecture, that's probably not the first thing that comes to mind is how easy it's going to be, especially in the types of environments where we work and the particular challenges that you might face. Um, so I think that in combination with Habib's comment that just start somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And, and that may help with this sense of ease is if you don't try to overcomplicate it early on, just come to the drawing board with the partner, your partners and just see where you can start, um, see where there's a need that can be met. And, and I think it will evolve over time. And this kind of gets to um, a number of people in, in the chat box are either commenting or questioning um, uh, the idea of a blended model moving forward or, or hybrid. So thinking into the future when the on the ground volunteer model will be resumed, uh, what are each of your sort of individual thoughts about um, if and how these two methods of, of training and mentoring our partners might uh, coexist together and, and is there an ongoing role for e-learning once uh, we do resume our on the ground activities? So uh, I guess palliative care in general, I mean, like most disciplines in medicine, I mean, it is a multidisciplinary uh, domain. So uh, the fact that you're able to incorporate uh, some experts remotely uh, will will always enhance the the learning experience. So uh, it, it's difficult to in, to imagine how things are going to be. But I mean, hopefully, when a volunteer is available on site, uh, again, every volunteer will have strengths in certain elements. Uh, some are great at communication. Some are great at didactic lectures. Others just you know, information source. Uh, 
if you're able to maintain weekly or bi-weekly uh, interactive session, um, I really think it will enhance the, the learning experience of the team, uh, the, the educational experience of the team. Uh, I would still like to rely more on the on-site element. Uh, you know, the, the whole volunteering experience is, is part of a cultural exposure. I mean, uh, because this is when you really feel you're, you're able to, to read your, uh, your group well uh, by being part of, of, their, uh, of their culture. Uh, you become a more effective teacher, uh, but certainly uh, the, the, the availability of a long distance uh, expert in a certain element uh, will definitely enhance the, uh, the, the learning experience. So I think the combination will be superior to either forum by itself. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I would agree there's uh, the synergy of having both would make for improved programs. Um, I have not been involved with HVO prior really to 2019, 2020. So I've never been on an actual trip. Uh, so I don't have familiarity with that, but I do like the mission and why I became involved in HVO is I admire the mission of training and educating and working to increase capacity of the workforce. On a local level, that's a, a really, um, big motivation for me to help out in this. Um, so with dentistry, a lot of it is going to be a lot of hands-on training as well, but I think supplementing it with academic type lectures and research, we're, we're going, you know, evidence-based, of course. So I think it's just a total compliment to be able to try to do both moving forward, where I don't know if before in the dental programs, if there was um, lectures or this, what we did over the Zoom, I, I'm not sure if it was just all on site. But there, there could easily be complementing each other. So. Yeah, and I think that's what we're excited to see um, across the board at HBO and, and where we see it going is that all of these projects that are, are um, as you said, it's remarkably easy at, at a lot of them. They are, they are adapting quickly to this e-learning model and everyone's sentiment seems to be, um, they're complementary they're gonna reinforce each other. So keeping uh, an e-learning model uh, integrated in our program model is only gonna reinforce the on the ground work that the volunteers are doing. Um, and as Habib said, I mean, being on the ground does really help uh, expose volunteers and expand their knowledge and their cultural understanding and those nuances that may influence and be critical to patient care in that environment or education. Um, and then those volunteers, I think, are even stronger as e-volunteers. They return home and they, they have that rapport, they have those relationships, and then they can just continue to develop that over time. So I think, I thank you both so much. That was, that was wonderful. And I, I have a few questions that I'm going to try to work through in the chat box. And then as well, if there are people that, that want to ask questions, I encourage you to just keep popping them in there. But we had one that just uh, was asking, can you comment on how you performed a needs assessment before and after the experience? So did you guys do formal needs assessment or was it just based on um, the prior needs assessment that HBO had already done uh, since these were existing projects and existing partnerships that we had? Um. I am not sure what the existing, pre-existing needs assessment may have been for this site in Nepal, um, but I know that, for, well, and you may be able to help clear this up too. My understanding was that they requested um, didactic lecture help and they had given like five or six topic areas that they needed. And pediatric dentistry was on there. And as I'm on the global health steering committee, I mean, oral health steering committee, I picked up on that one and said, oh, we can put a team together for these lectures for pediatric dentistry. And then we emailed back and forth, would this be helpful? Yes or no. And I, we sent them our topics ahead of time. Would these topics be good? Yes or no. Would you like articles? Would you like to send us to send them? Will your students read the articles? And we got a lot of feedback just from emailing before we did it, which was, and then it was, they were always like, yes, that sounds great. So we did that. And then I showed you, we had a survey to do our post follow-up. Great. I, I, I guess for us, it was mainly a, we're still in a survival mode. Um, so uh, 
the needs assessment was fairly obvious. Um, so as you know, with HBO, normally we go through annual review and um, uh, how we Im improve things based on the experience of the prior year, but that was the first year for the program. So it, it was more of a, a survival mode type of need. Uh, what do we need? What do we do to sustain the program? Uh, and, and that was basically what, uh, what, what drove uh, what, what actually happened. Thank you, Habib. Um, yeah, and I have, I see here that Dr. Hollander, um, you're welcome to unmute if you, you have a comment you'd like to make. Uh, yes, I'm Brian Hollander. I'm the project director for Nepal. And first of all, I want to thank Habib and Elizabeth. It was really exciting to hear about your projects. And uh, as far as the last comment about the needs and putting it in, I think Dr. Copley has been excellent at letting us know what he needs. I think the next step is to figure out exactly in their curriculum what they need to fit the lectures into their curriculum and especially with this new HBO Zoom site that you've developed, which I think is going to be excellent. Those recorded lectures, they could have, they could have uh, a library of lectures that they could insert into their curriculum, just be a little more focused on, on what exactly works. But so far, all the lectures have been very well received. And I think we've been lucky in Nepal and Bhutan that they're such amazing countries with such amazing people that make the volunteers felt welcome when they were there. And also just the communications over the phone. Uh, we're lucky to work in those two amazing countries where they have this compassionate, uh, loving, kind group of people you work with. Um, I like Tabib's uh, having a set hour that he, every week, it makes it good for continuation. I think that's great. I could see how it could happen in Nepal with, I know that we talked about in orthodontics having consults, case consults over the phone. And if they have a set time for that, maybe every week, every two weeks, where the students can talk about difficult cases, I think that might be really good. Um, and I think you stress the importance of the communication with the with the host country. And once again, we're with Doc, you mentioned Dr. Copley, who's pretty amazing. Uh, he is very good. So that's that helps so much in both online or on-site communication. So my hat's off to Dr. Copley for doing such a great job on that. Um, yeah, I think the with this new Zoom format, which we're going to test out next week. Uh, I think it's, I thank you, April, for working so hard on that. And thank you for organizing this lecture. But thank you all. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. And, you know, the project has definitely been um, successful in large part to, to your leadership. Um, and to your relationship, as you've alluded to, and, and the leadership of Dr. Copley at the site. So it's truly a, a you know, a testament to how, um, you know, our projects are only as successful as our, our volunteers and our, our partners overseas. So I think, I, you know, just thank you for all the work that you've done on the Nepal project and your leadership. It's been wonderful. So I have a, a question here about the Bhutan project uh, about how the training uh, might be expanded beyond that initial cohort of nurses, Habib. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so the, the original plan, which we're hoping we'll be able to, uh, to continue on with, is that they started with the first core group of nurses, and the idea was those become nursing educators. So as nursing educate, as nurse educators, uh, they were preparing a course to be incorporated in the nursing school next door to the hospital uh, to have a palliative care, palliative, co palliative care nursing course. Uh, so this way, those nurses become the, the educators for future nurses. And the nursing students uh, would rotate with the oncology nurses as well during their home visits. So that was one element of exposure with the idea of, well, as the program expands, there will be more training happening. Um, 
as far as investing in the uh, the education of, of existing nurses, uh, so uh, Annette was working with ASCO on trying to get funding for uh, the existing nurses or whoever is interested to attend uh, nursing leadership uh, palliative care courses. There are a few uh, worldwide which currently are available uh, remotely as well. The time difference is a little bit of an issue for Bhutan, but uh, we're working on that element. Uh, but basically, to uh, for continuity in the program, we obviously need more than the current core. Um, so we're hoping we'll go back on track to train the nursing students to, to give them exposure to palliative care, because that's really the, the main element. Um, how, how do we make that part of the of the healthcare culture, meaning the idea of palliative care, and uh, spending some resources. Uh, and enhancing the education of those nurses through uh, international conferences that can become available. Uh, the eventual goal is to identify a physician leader uh, who could become a palliative care specialist. There are two who are uh, potentials. Uh, that is a little bit more complicated because that requires uh, either funding or delineation by the Ministry of Health to make that position happen. So it's not only an interest by the doctor that needs to be a, uh, a governmental designation. Uh, so that's being worked on as well. Thank you, Habib. And I, I see a question here and from Leslie, and I see you're also unmuted. So maybe do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Um, so my name is Lassie Sunby and I'm um, a part of an organization called Two Worlds. Uh, and uh, we are very involved in the call related to building capacity about palliative care. And my question is, I'm wondering if you're already connected in with NAPCARE, which is the Nepal Association of Palliative Care, um, because we've worked a lot with them. I've been to Nepal seven times. It sounds like we're doing very similar work related to palliative care. Um, I just wondered sort of who, where, you, where you're connected in Nepal. Um, um, thank you, Leslie. And uh, our palliative care program is currently in Bhutan, Bhutan. Uh, but there is actually, uh, I've, I've heard about uh, your project. Uh, you probably, I don't know if you've been, if you've connected with David Nixon, uh, David Nixon from New Zealand. Um, he's done some of the palliative care in, um, in Bhutan and he's in contact with the two worlds organization uh, mm -hmm. to try to find common ground so how we can streamline our resources, educational resources or patient care services. Right. Uh, that, uh, because it seems like, as you said, we seem to be doing similar things. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, and that's the idea. David Nixon, Dr. Nixon, he's a palliative care specialist in New Zealand who spent six months in Bhutan. Uh, he's kind of uh, the liaison uh, gathering information with the relationship with our potential relationship with two worlds. So I, I don't have more information at this point, but I know he's, he's working on that element. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, it sounds like we're doing very similar work. It's very exciting, thank you. So we just have a, a, just a couple more minutes and I, I don't think I'm missing any questions in the, the chat box. Um, so if anybody has any other questions or comments and they, they want to unmute, I can try to um, bring you guys online here. Yeah, I, I guess the very first question was uh, about what kind of uh, examples of palliative care and what environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Bhutan, it is purely rural, as rural as it can be, I have to say. Um, so uh, most of the time we served initially patients within walking distance from the hospital until we got a donation from the Ministry of Health for a car and a driver. Um, and this is when we started expanding the circle. So it's definitely a very rural um, environment. And the palliative care issues are the same that we deal here. Mainly, I, I should clarify here that uh, until the program becomes very established, we focus on oncology only, and nothing against any other discipline, of course, but uh, we figured we can um, streamline the process, iron out any possible challenging by focusing on one discipline first. So we're seeing oncology palliative care uh, only at this point. And once we get 
all our uh, operations in place uh, will expand to non-ecological uh, discipline. So um, it spans the gamut from uh, problems with pain control, pain management is probably the most common, dyspnea, um, uh, uh, mental status uh, problems, and uh, you know the, the usual palliative care problems that we see here. Okay. Well, thank you, Elizabeth and Habib. This is this was wonderful. I think um, it's nice because you guys had projects that looked quite different. Uh, use different technologies. You know, Elizabeth's was part of a, a degree program with students that are, you know, enrolled in formal training, where Habib's is more of an informal uh, mentorship and support. And so I think, you know, your, your presentations and your work complemented each other well, just to provide a really nice um, example of just the types of e-learning engagement um, that HBO volunteers can be involved in. It, and it really is diverse, and it really is about identifying the needs of the partner institutions, uh, working with existing technologies uh, and just starting starting small and see where it goes from there. So I, I applaud and thank you both for all of your work um, in getting these projects off the ground. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where these projects go, but also just in general uh, where HBO's e-learning goes in the coming years. So thank you both so much and thank you everybody for attending. And if anybody has any questions for Elizabeth or Habib, um, or HVO about our e-learning projects, please do be in touch. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody on our next our next webinar.